He is risen. He is risen indeed. This morning at the sunrise service, the birds and their songs proved to us that they were just as excited as we were to be celebrating Easter. Uh, pastor told the story of a young new convert that was in his church for the first time on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning. And he stood up and gave the greeting, He is risen. And in the excitement and enthusiasm of his newfound faith, this young believer, before anybody else could respond and louder than everybody else, hollered out, you betcha. (laughs) Maybe that is the joy that we need to have when we celebrate the risen Christ today. He is risen. You betcha. (laughs) Would you stand and greet those around you with the peace of Christ and the joy of the resurrection?
Well, we continue to sing our alleluias to our risen Savior, and what a privilege it is to sing to him on this most glorious Easter morning. I invite you to take out your hymnals. That's the red book that you can find underneath of a seat in front of you or somewhere there along your row. We'll be using the hymnal this morning. We'll begin with number 215, which is titled Alleluia, Alleluia. You heard a little bit of it just a minute ago with the choir. 215, if you're able, would you join me by standing as we worship the Lord together in song. Christ the Lord is risen today and every day, number 217.
number 225, Worship Christ the Risen King. We'll sing stanzas one, two, and five, and please be ready to go right on to number 220 after we sing this one, 225.
What an amazing day is this day. Uh, the amazing love of God providing the amazing grace of forgiveness, which makes possible for all who know Jesus, amazing lives and amazing hope and amazing joy. No matter what life brings to us on earth, all in Jesus stand to inherit the very presence of God and the wealth of his kingdom forever. His kingdom, where health always wins over sickness and joy overcomes sadness and love squashes out hatred and life defeats death. And it's all because Jesus lives. His life of obedience to God the Father made it all possible for all who will follow him. We come to worship today, we lift our praises, and we come to bend our knee before the King of Kings, risen from the grave and leading the way for us to eternal life. As we sing together our call to prayer printed here on your worship guide, you're welcome to come to the altar here and give him thanks today. Uh, or maybe you have a need that you'd like to lay before him, a special need that you uh, would like to lay before the Lord, the healer, the King of Kings. Uh, why don't you come and do that while we sing our call to prayer. It's in your uh, worship guide there, Christ Beside Me, one of the stanzas of that. And then uh, I'll lead us in prayer. Let's sing together, prepare ourselves for prayer. Christ Father, as we arrive at the tomb today, just as those first disciples did, not only do we find it open, more importantly, we find it empty. Today, we know what Mary and Peter and John didn't know on that first Easter morning. We know that a miracle has happened that has changed our world. Your son, Jesus, who on Friday was the perfect sacrifice is today the firstborn from the dead. He's the first through the darkness. He's the first through the river. He's the first to raise his hand in victory over humanity's greatest threat and enemy. And he's the one to invite the rest of us to follow him and live. Father, we thank you for the grace you've given us and for the love that you've shown to us. Thank you for making a way where there was no way for your wandering creation to return to you. With our voices in song and prayer and praise today, we say thank you. With our intentions and our commitment to follow you, Jesus, we say thank you. In what we do, in the things we value, in how we treat one another, we say thank you. In every way, Lord, we make it our goal to please you as your gratefully redeemed children. Holy Spirit of God, we invite you to meet with us here in a special way today. And not with us alone, but with your people in every place around your world where Christ is lifted up. As this resurrection day unfolds, establish its truth in natural and in supernatural ways to draw people to yourself. Make your people, make your church an effective instrument of your peace and love for humanity. Help us speak about you with power to those who doubt. And may every aspect of our lives, both individually and together as a church body, bring you glory. Lord, we ask you to bring healing and help to those we love. Bring peace in those places around our world where there is war today. Lord, bring freedom 
where there's oppression, and relief where there's poverty and hunger. Bring light, Lord, to those in darkness. Convince those we know who have rejected you and who walk outside your grace. Even today, convince them that you really are who you say you are, that they might be saved. Jesus, we come together this morning to lift to you an offering of worship. It is far from perfect. We know that. But it comes from sincere hearts that are so very glad for the reality of resurrection in our lives. May we give ourselves to you, Jesus, as completely as you gave yourself for us. Receive our praise, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Nathan Riffle, and I have the privilege of reading scripture this morning. Our scripture passage for today is going to be John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Again, that's John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. If you are able, will you please join me for the reading of God's word? Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still laying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. God. Children, this is your time. You can join me up here. I need some help. But you have to not open the thing that I'm giving to you until I tell you it's time. All right. Can you open that? Yep, and then tell me what it is and what it has to do with Easter. What is it? It's a donkey, and Jesus rode on it into Jerusalem. Good job. Can you open that one? Coins. What do you think the coins are for? Anybody? What do coins have to do? Go ahead. Clothes. Yeah, they gave up Jesus. Judas gave up Jesus for some money. I mean, I don't know if they're forbidden. Mia, do you want to open that one? Tell me what it is. A cup. What do you think a cup has to do with the Easter story? Well, yeah, what did he do? The Last Supper, yeah. He broke bread and shared the cup with his disciples. You guys are so good. You want to open that one, Alex? 
You tell me what it is. It's a little hard. It's okay. Who can help him out? Allie? Yeah, what does that have to do with the Easter story? He went out. Yes, you are right. He went out and he prayed. What did he pray? Do you remember? He prayed. That is something that he prayed. He prayed that if God might not have to have him suffer at the cross, he would like for that to be the case. But he also prayed that God's will be done no matter what. All right. You want to go with that one, Jaden? You know what it is? What was that for? Do you need help? Yeah, they used a whip to beat Jesus. Want to open that one? What is it? A rooster. What was the rooster for? <laughs> Go ahead, help her out. Yeah, Peter denied Jesus, and then they, he heard the rooster crow. All right, got a few more. This might work out perfect. What you got? Yep, what's that for? They put it on Jesus' head, a crown of thorns. All right, here you want to open that one? A cross, what was the cross for? Yes, Jesus died. I have the perfect amount. That's great. You want to open that one? One for me? Okay. You know what that is? It's a spear. So does anyone remember what? This is a sad part of the story. Yeah, they cut him in the side with a spear. Did you get one yet? Yep, the cloth that laid over Jesus' body. Bennett, you want to open that one? What do you think a stone's for? Yeah, the stone was rolled away from the tomb. All right, there's one more. What do you think's in this one? Jesus. Nothing. Why is there nothing in this egg? Because the tomb was, yeah, good job. You guys did great, and that was the perfect amount. No, you can't keep them. I need them again. <laughs> I'm sure you got plenty of eggs over the past week. <laughs> All right, will you guys pray with me? Lord, thank you for these kids. Thank you for the Easter story and um, just all the different ways that you engaged throughout that week, all the different things that you went to help us all to remember those things. Help this be a tool to help us remember. And just bless this day that you have risen. In your name we pray, amen. There is no children's worship, so you got to go back and sit with your families. If you would, take some time and complete the welcome card that you, that's enclosed in the worship folder that you picked up when you came in. You can drop that in the offering boxes as you leave the sanctuary today. Also, if you would, throughout the day, take some time and read through the announcements that are printed in the worship folder. There's a lot of events happening this week. There's a ladies' night out on Monday. There's a prayer and fasting event here in the sanctuary on Wednesday. There's also a blood drive that happens here on Wednesday. There's an overseas fellowship on Friday. There's a connections class on Sunday. Sunday. There's a social on Sunday night. There's a lot of things happening. So if you would take time to read through those events that are listed in the worship folder. The Easter flowers, we say thank you to all of you who have sponsored these flowers for today. Uh, feel free to take, take whatever flower is yours after the 11 o'clock service. And thank you once again for sponsoring them in honor and memory of loved ones and friends. Out in the foyer as you leave today, you will see the yard signs right to the left of the exit doors. Feel free to take one and put that in your yard to let uh, others that go 
past your house, know that you are a believer in Jesus and you are celebrating him being risen from the dead. Also out in the foyer is a table with some Easter outreach booklets on it. Feel free to take as many of those as you can give away to those who need to be encouraged in their faith and need to know Jesus loves them. Scripture says that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. The same could really be said of anything or anyone that we're tempted to love more than God. There can only be one ultimate love of our lives. When we choose God's ways and desires over everything else, we're choosing to love Him ultimately. Choosing anything else as an ultimate love winds up making us less of a person than God created us to be. Father, we give to you out of love for you. Help our love for you to be what it should be and the way in which we give ourselves to you and your work. Reflect, let, that, let our love reflect the way that we give. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'd uh, care to turn there with me, our text for today is from John chapter 20, the passage there that was read for us, um, where we find in that passage a rolling stone that is even older than Mick Jagger, uh, and that is a symbol of victory for Jesus and also for us. On Friday... Good Friday, Jesus, this miracle baby of Bethlehem, was killed. He was crucified on a cross by religious leaders who would neither open themselves to understand God's plan of redemption, nor give up their own authority and power. In his death, Jesus left behind this small group of devoted friends. Mark's gospel tells us that two of them, interestingly, neither of them part of the original 12 disciples. 
men named Nicodemus and Joseph from Arimathea. Uh, those two buried Jesus' body. Joseph even donated his new uh, family tomb for the cause. Now, um, final resting places. And, and with Jesus, we use that phrase with a little bit of irony, don't we? Final resting places in Jesus' day were taken very seriously and were quite different from today's cemeteries. For the sake of the honor of the human body, no Jew would ever be cremated. And only the poorest of people would be buried in the ground. Most Jews used tombs chiseled into rocky cliffs or hillsides with a small opening that could lead to even many rooms inside, suitable for a whole extended family's use. And once the dead was placed inside, a heavy stone would then serve as a door. They were usually large stones, and they were cut into the shape of a disc. <laughs> and a frisbee is what I could find. Uh, in the shape of a disc, and they rolled in a groove chiseled into the stone just outside the doorway. And often, archaeologists say, those grooves in the floor were intentionally cut on a slope. So gravity helped keep the already heavy door closed, and it helped keep potential grave robbers out. It was no easy door to open. Okay? Can you see it in your mind without the five ultimate on it. People also buried quickly in Jesus' day, usually within eight hours or so of their death, since Hebrew people did not embalm like the Egyptian people did. Jesus, though, was buried even more quickly than usual, since he died so close to the beginning of the Sabbath day. He was buried too quickly, in fact, to be properly, completely prepared with wrappings and spices and everything else that Hebrews did to a dead body. And the women followers of Jesus would not let that go. Uh, so obeying Sabbath laws, they waited until the Sabbath was over. But then the next day, Sunday, they came to prepare the body. And they went to the tomb very early. But in their hurry and in their grief, they apparently didn't even think about how they'd move the stone until they were on their way. We do that kind of thing ourselves from time to time, don't we? In the midst of either grief or excitement or something else, we start things that we're not quite sure how we'll finish. In truth, sometimes that doesn't work out too well for us, but it worked out just fine for those women on Easter morning. As they arrived at the tomb, they were shocked to find that the stone had already been moved, which was great news in a way. But then what seemed like terrible news followed quickly. Jesus' body wasn't there. John tells us how at least Mary Magdalene learned what had really happened. We heard that as Nathan read it. Jesus spoke with her directly and gave her the privilege of telling the rest, which is a beautifully ironic thing if you know anything at all about Mary Magdalene. That Mary, formerly the most sinful of the group, remember Luke 8 tells us that Jesus had cast seven demons out of her. Jesus gives the formerly most sinful the great honor of announcing his resurrection. God often does cool things like that. He also does cool things like moving stones. Now, when I say the word roll back, what comes to your mind? <laughs> there's several things. If you're mechanically minded, you probably think of a truck. And there's a truck that the bed sort of tilts up and slides backward. So things like shipping containers and dumpsters and broken vehicles can be easily loaded. That's what I automatically think of because of the number of broken vehicles that I've experienced in my life. Uh, rollback also has military and political meanings. It's, it's the forcing of an army or a government to return to some former position or policy. If you're a Walmart shopper, like several in the choir are, <laughs> you think of their marketing campaign 
to lower prices. They push back prices of, uh, since it's Easter, let's say eggs. They roll back the price of eggs from ludicrous to merely ridiculous. Uh, so roll back is a really useful word. But today, we find its greatest and most glorious meeting in the rollback of the door of the tomb. Now, most of us have this image in our minds, and there's quite a lot of both ancient and contemporary art that suggests and encourages it. This image that on Easter morning, an angel descended from heaven, rolled back the stone from the entry so that Jesus could emerge, scare the guards that were posted there nearly to death, cause a literal earthquake to happen, and then he would go on about his business. But scripture clearly says that by the time the angel arrives, Jesus had already, he might say, left the building, okay? That happened before the stone was rolled back. It happened before the guard's near-death experience. It happened before the earthquake and everything else. Look at Matthew's account of that morning if you wonder about it. We typically think the stone was rolled back to let Jesus out, as if a mere stone could keep a man who's come back to life in a tomb. No, the stone was all, wasn't rolled back to let Jesus out. Jesus was already out. The stone was rolled back to let us in. The stone was rolled back so the women and later the men who had apparently slept in and through both those men and those women, ultimately all of us, anyone who would hear their eyewitness testimony, the stone was rolled back so that we could see and be convinced that as Jesus promised, if you destroy this temple, I will rebuild it in three days. The stone was rolled back to add one miracle on top of another for the sake of our faith. You see, there was no sign at all of Jesus' resurrection at first, when it first happened. Jesus left the tomb without disturbing anything. Not even the grave clothes he wore were disturbed. That heavy stone door that took multiple men, or according to Matthew, one pretty ripped angel, <laughs> to move, that door remained in place. And the seals that had been stuck on there by the Romans, they were still there. And the guards were still standing there outside, totally unaware that the one they were guarding had already left. Everything on the outside was calm. It was all peaceful. In fact, you know, had the angel not come and rolled back the stone, those Roman guards, who, by the way, cared nothing for Jewish burial practices, those Roman guards would have turned those women away and they would have stood there guarding an empty tomb for who knows how long. The rollback of the stone was the turning point of what happened on Easter morning. That's what let us in to investigate as the disciples did and to see this amazing thing that God had done. It's what allowed those first disciples to know for certain and even suffer their own deaths for the sake of proclaiming and defending what really happened to Jesus. It's what lets them know that the, roll, the rollback of the stone is what let them know that Jesus did not somehow survive the cross, move the stone, slip past the guards, and then arrive at the disciples' doorstep later on. The rollback of the stone is what let everyone know that the disciples did not somehow get past the guards, break into the tomb, steal Jesus' body, and then claim that he'd risen from the dead. No, the rollback of the stone by the angel is what let them and us know that Jesus was dead. He was in a guarded tomb with no back door and a sealed front door that no one person could move. And yet miraculously now, that door is open, the tomb is empty, Jesus is out, he's alive, he's appearing to people all over the place, and he's proclaiming this message for all humanity, 
turn from your sin and your sinful ways and believe in me. Believe that I have died for you to pay sin's cost. Believe that I am now alive again. And that if you will give your life to follow me, you can have a relationship with God the Father like I have. Not just for now, but forever. Because just as I've been raised from the dead, Jesus said, so will you be too. Victory over humanity's greatest enemy, death, it's possible. Because of Jesus and the rolled back stone reveals the proof for all to see. Theologian Wilbert Howard notes how the Eastern Church tends to focus on the manger. The Eastern Church tends to make the incarnation, Jesus' birth, the centerpiece of the Christian story. And he says the Western Church tends to focus on Calvary. We take, we're part of the Western church, so we take the cross as our chief symbol. But if you look carefully, the New Testament over and over returns to the empty tomb. The New Testament says it's the empty tomb that is first of all, most of all, and last of all, the proof of Jesus' victory. The proof that God has beaten death and that evil and sin are doomed to destruction. And the rollback of the stone is what lets us see it. So we can believe with confidence. Even today, we can believe with confidence. Friends, I don't have to tell you that we live in a crazy world that seems to be getting crazier by the day. A world where nothing but uncertainty is certain. Just like that tragic bridge in Baltimore, even the most secure of things of days past seem to be crumbling before our eyes and more and more are wondering what is worthy, who is worthy of our faith and our trust. I can tell you with confidence, Jesus is worthy. Jesus Christ is risen indeed. He offers us the proof of the rolled back stone and the empty tomb. And he tells us that if we will put our faith in him and in the events of the resurrection morning, if we will follow him, whatever the cost, we will enjoy the benefits with him forever. If you have never put your faith in Jesus and in his resurrection, if you've never made the decision to follow him. I'm going to lead us in a prayer in closing. And if you mean it, and if you pray it with me, you can begin your journey with him today. The rolled back stone offers the evidence and tells us that we who will follow him, we can have victory over death, and we can have everything eternal to gain. That is what this day is all about. Father, on that first Easter morning, you not only rolled back death itself from Jesus' life, but you rolled back the certainty and the finality of death from all humanity, all who would follow you, all who would believe. You made life and life with you possible for us again. Life like it used to be before sin took over in the garden. And Father, far more than even the very best rollback at Walmart, we want to get in on what you've made possible for us. Forgive us from the sin that we have committed against you. Father, and do whatever you need to do to cement our trust in you and in Jesus, your son. Help us to follow him with all we are and all we have so that just like the stone, death for us might be rolled back for eternity. Lord, we give you ourselves today along with our praise and thanks for the victory you've won and that you've made possible for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is so worthy and because of that, 
we will sing one of the greatest choral compositions ever written, in my opinion, on this greatest Sunday ever. It's the Hallelujah Chorus. It's number 37 in your hymnals. Don't panic. If Jesus came out of the tomb, you can sing this. <laughs> or at least do your best. And if you get lost, as we always say, just keep saying hallelujah, and we'll all come out in the end together. Okay, number 37, if you're able, would you stand with me as we sing these wonderful words together? You betcha. <laughs> I think next year I'll sing the bass part. <clears throat> the women 
on that first Easter Sunday did not know what to make of all they saw, all they experienced. An angel had to explain it to some of them, and Jesus himself had to explain it to Mary Magdalene. In a similar way, most of our world today does not know what to make of this day. Uh, for them, it's all about dressing up, it's about family getting together, eating together, and then some combination of spring and eggs and baskets and bunnies. Someone needs to explain to them that Easter, Resurrection Day, means so much more than those things. And we who follow Jesus, we are the ones to do it. We are the explaining angels. We are the body of Christ to our world. So go and tell. Go and tell the world that Jesus has rolled back death. And the roll back of the stone is their invitation to come in and to investigate and to believe. Thanks for coming to worship today. The Lord bless and keep you. Amen. Thank you.